Hi folks, and welcome to chapter 21 on skin and eye infections. From here on out, our focus is going to be on exploring different infectious diseases of the various body systems. And in this chapter, our focus is exclusively on the skin and the eyes. These chapters will all have a similar structure. We will start out by discussing a little bit about the anatomy and physiology of the body system that we are focusing on, and then we'll move into a discussion of microbes belonging to different categories that can cause various diseases of that body system. So we'll start here by taking a look at the structure of the skin. The skin has three layers of tissue, starting at the outermost layer with the epidermis which is a thin layer of dead cells and keratin that resides on the outer surface of the dermis, which is the middle layer. It is thicker and is comprised of connective tissue. And underneath the dermis is the hypodermis, which is composed of adipose or fat tissue as well as more connective tissue. The skin is interspersed with various portals of entry, including hair follicles, sweat glands, and sebaceous glands. And while these do present portals of entry for certain microbes, they also cause the skin to have some of its physical and chemical properties that inhibit microbial growth. Skin is dry, salty, and acidic as a result of sweat that is released in perspiration and um, a mild amount of acid that is created through the sebum or the oil that is generated from the sebaceous glands. Your skin also has a robust population of normal microbial resonance, or your normal skin microbiota, which are in general resistant to the physical factors that inhibit other microbes from residing on the skin, including drying and high salt content. Staphylococcus and micrococcus are two genera that have these special qualities that allow them to reside on the skin. Parts of the body that trap perspiration, for example your armpits, tend to grow a more diverse and larger number of microbes than other parts of the skin because the greater availability of water means that there's less limitation in terms of which types of species are able to grow. Some microbes only grow inside of hair follicles, and these species also have to exhibit special qualities. But to give you an initial checkpoint, uh, about one member of the skin microbiome, Corinobacterium xerosis, this species resides only on the surface of the skin. It cannot grow inside of follicles or glands. So based on this knowledge, how would you classify Corinobacterium xerosis based upon its oxygen requirements? Which oxygen category does it likely belong to if it can only grow on the surface of the skin and not in follicles or glands? Now that we've talked about some basic anatomy and physiology of the skin, we are going to dive into our microbial diseases and infectious agents. And as I said, we're going to divide these up by category. So we're going to address the bacterial diseases first, and then we will move on to other categories. We'll get started with staphylococcal skin infections. Staphylococcal skin infections are caused by members of the genus Staphylococcus, which have the traits of being gram-positive, spherical or coccus-shaped, and arranged in clusters. There are two major members of the Staphylococcus genus, that are relevant to our discussion here. One of them is Staphylococcus epidermidis, and the other one is Staphylococcus aureus. Staphylococcus epidermidis is a very prevalent member of your normal skin microbiome. And under normal circumstances, it is completely harmless to you. It is only pathogenic when the skin is broken and is able to obtain a portal of entry into the skin often by forming biofilms on indwelling medical devices such as catheters. What we can see in this image right here is a sample of Staphylococcus epidermidis developing into a biofilm on the surface of a catheter. In fact, it is the single most common cause of infections of these nature. 
Despite Staphylococcus epidermidis being a common cause of these types of infections, it is far less dangerous than its counterpart, Staphylococcus aureus, which is by far the most pathogenic species in the Staphylococcus genus. It is found in the nasal passages of 20% of the population on a permanent basis, and 60% of the population exhibit Staphylococcus aureus in their nasal passages at least transiently or impermanently. What makes Staphylococcus aureus so much more dangerous is the fact that it is equipped with a much larger amount of genetic information that gives it additional virulence factors encoded in its genome. It produces special enzymes called coagulases that clot, clot blood. It produce, produces uh, proteins that block the chemotaxis of neutrophils from chasing it down and destroying it. It produces toxins that kill other phagocytes or other leukocytes that perform phagocytosis. Even when it is engulfed, it can survive phagocytosis inside of the leukocyte. It produces proteins that neutralize antimicrobials. Its cell wall is resistant to lysozyme, and antibiotic resistance is common and continues to increase among Staphylococcus aureus populations, including multi-drug resistance exhibited by MRSA, or methicillin-resistant Staphylococcus aureus. All of these features are things that Staphylococcus epidermidis does not exhibit and make Staphylococcus aureus much more dangerous, whereas Staphylococcus epidermidis is only able to cause disease when an opening in the skin is created for it, Staphylococcus aureus can merely begin an infection when the microbes enter a hair follicle. When a hair follicle becomes infected, it's called folliculitis, and we can see an image of folliculitis here on the upper image. Now folliculitis is a very mild infection, and Staphylococcus aureus is all around us, so it cannot be avoided. Many people carry it and transmit it um, just by virtue of touching their nose and then transmitting it to another person. But the people who are most at risk of acquiring these initial stages of infection include people who play contact sports, people who share athletic equipment, people who live in community settings, or people who have weakened immune systems. So the best way to prevent folliculitis from arising is uh, essentially to practice good hygiene if you are in one of these risk groups and prevent the skin from being irritated. Most cases of folliculitis, as I said, are mild and not serious, but it can develop further into what is called a furuncle or a boil, which is where these infected follicles spread and invade the tissue around them. And these boils can further invade surrounding tissue and turn into what's called a carbuncle, which then can develop into systemic illness where you experience all of the symptoms of uh, fever, inflammation, um, pain, weakness, malaise. And this is a very serious stage of the infection which requires addressing. Staphylococcus is not the only genus of bacteria that can cause skin infections. Streptococcus can also cause skin infections, namely the species Streptococcus pyogenes, which has different characteristics than or, pardon me, Staphylococcus members. It is gram-positive and spherical, but they are arranged in chains rather than in clusters, as the name Streptococcus suggests, and they are beta-hemolytic. So beta hemolytic, you may remember, has to do with the relationship that these bacteria have to red blood cells. If a bacterium is beta hemolytic, what can it do? So this, this ability to perform beta hemolysis is a virulence factor possessed by Streptococcus pyogenes. And like Staphylococcus aureus, it can infect the skin to different degrees of severity. Cellulitis is an inflammation of the dermis or hypodermis, which leads to warm red patches on the skin, as can be seen in this image. Erysipelas is a large, intensely inflamed patch of skin, 
often on the legs or on the face. And the most severe form of streptococcal skin infection is called necrotizing fasciitis, which is colloquially referred to as flesh-eating bacteria. Now, flesh-eating bacteria is not a professional medical term, and in fact, this phenomenon can be caused by members of other genera of bacteria, but it is most commonly caused by Streptococcus pyogenes. Necrotizing fasciitis uh, results in rapid destruction of tissue, and the mortality rate associated with this condition is over 40%, so it is an extremely dangerous condition. Next, we have pseudomonad skin infections. Members of the genus Pseudomonas are gram-negative, aerobic, and bacilli-shaped. They are particularly difficult to disinfect because they are capable of surviving on unusual carbon sources. They have a broad range of metabolic capabilities, and so um, they have been known to be found growing on adhesives or even in some types of mild disinfectants. They are, in addition to this, resistant to many antibiotics. And the most pathogenic member of this genus, Pseudomonas aeruginosa, is a common opportunistic pathogen in hospitals, which we'll talk about in just a moment. But before we talk about its role in nosocomial infections, Pseudomonas aeruginosa is also often responsible for two common infections that people acquire from swimming pools and hot tubs. One of them is called Pseudomonas folliculitis. Again, this is an infection of the hair follicles that results in a rash of raised or flattened red spots. This disease is not serious and it is self-limiting, lasting about two weeks before going away on its own. Otitis externa, also known as swimmer's ear, can occur when Pseudomonas aeruginosa invades the ear canal and causes external, uh, er, pardon me, uh, infection of the external ear canal, which leads up to the eardrum. Pseudomonas is not the only cause of otitis externa, but it is one of the more common ones. And as we said, it is also a common cause of hospital-acquired infections or nosocomial infections. It is the most frequent pathogen isolated from patients who have been in the hospital for over one week. It is particularly opportunistic in second and third degree burn patients and is also capable of forming dense biofilms on indwelling medical devices like catheters. So we've now talked about streptococcal skin infections, staphylococcal skin infections, and pseudomonad skin infections. So let's say that you are looking at a gram-positive, caucus-shaped pathogen that has been isolated from an infection localized around an indwelling catheter. What would be the most likely infectious agent based upon these characteristics? Our final bacterial skin infection that we'll discuss is acne. Acne is the most common human skin disease, and it's particularly common, I'm sure as many of us know, among teenagers. An estimated 80% of teenagers are affected by acne. Acne is caused when the skin cells that naturally slough off of the surface of your face combine with sebum or oil to clog the hair follicles. Now, when a follicle is simply clogged, this is not considered an infection. But when that clogged pore is able to provide an environment for a bacterium to take hold, then a tiny local infection can take place. One of the more common species that initiates these tiny, tiny local infections is Propionobacterium acnes, which is particularly conducive to creating acne because as part of its metabolism, it is able to consume sebum, or oil that is produced on the face. So this completes our look at bacterial infections of the skin. Now we're going to move on to talking about viral infections of the skin. 
and we will lead off with warts. Warts are benign skin growths caused by members of the viral family papillomavirus. You may remember when we were learning about viral families and papillomaviridae that papillomaviruses were associated with tumors and growths, and warts are an example of this. The incubation period for warts is multiple weeks, and while warts can be annoying or in, even in some cases, such as when they occur on the bottom of the foot, they can be painful, um, they are generally considered not to be serious or life-threatening, and they can be treated with freezing, drying, topical application of acid, or even lasers. Our next disease is roseola. Roseola is caused by human herpes virus 6 or 7, although human herpes virus 6 is the more common cause of roseola. It is transmitted by uh, droplet transmission or direct contact with salivary excretions of an infected person. It's associated with flu-like symptoms that develop initially and then are followed by a rash that begins on the chest and stomach and then spreads to the limbs. It's extremely common among young children and considered to be very contagious. And these are some features that it shares in common with our next disease, fifth disease. Fifth disease is named for the fact that it is the fifth of the childhood rash causing illnesses um, that people used to get uh, very commonly, including measles, rubella, roseola, scarlet fever, and fifth disease. It's caused by parvovirus B19, and it is transmitted uh, like roseola through droplet or direct contact transmission. And it is known for producing cold like symptoms that are followed by a rash on the face that is brightest on the cheeks and then can spread to other parts of the body. It's common and mild among children, but among adults, it can present more serious symptoms, as is the case for many diseases, um, some of which we'll talk about in this chapter and others we'll talk about in later chapters. Next, we have herpes. Herpes is caused by one of two viruses in the herpes simplex virus group. We have herpes simplex virus one or two. HSV1 is primarily transmitted orally, and by some estimates, uh, studies have found that as much as 65% of the US population is infected. Most of these people don't know that they are infected because they are completely asymptomatic. But for some people, these manifest as temporary lesions around the mouth that come and go and that we refer to as cold sores, but they really have nothing to do with the common cold at all. HSV2 is primarily transmitted sexually, and this too uh, produces mostly asymptomatic infections but some of those infections manifest as temporary lesions in the genital region. It's important to note that either HSV1 or H HSV2 can be transmitted via either route. For example, HSV2 can be transmitted orally and HSV1 can be transmitted sexually, but they do have a preferred transmission route where HSV1 is oral and HSV2 is sexual. As of yet, there has not been a method of curing herpes simplex virus infections. However, there are very effective uh, antimicrobial drugs used to control outbreaks that occur between the latent stages, such as acyclovir and related compounds. Next, we have smallpox. Smallpox is caused by variola virus, of which there are two different derivatives. There's variola major and variola minor. Variola major is the more dangerous of the two by far. It has a mortality rate of 20 to 60 percent among adults, which translates to somewhere between one in five to three in five people, but its child mortality rate 
is 80%, which translates to four in five children who contract variola major perish. Variola minor has a much lower mortality rate of less than 1%. So smallpox is an extremely dangerous disease, which thankfully is not around anymore due to vaccination. Its portal of entry is the respiratory system, which means that in some guides and textbooks, you will also see this classified as a respiratory infection, even though its primary manifestation of symptoms are on the skin. From the respiratory system, it travels uh, systemically and leads to the formation of pustular lesions on the surface of the skin. And it is the only human disease to have ever been completely eradicated worldwide, um, as we've talked about before, through an aggressive vaccination program to eliminate this disease. Thanks to those vaccination programs, there is no more uh, community transmitted smallpox anywhere in the world, and the only place where samples of smallpox still exist are in two laboratories, one in Russia and one in the United States. And those are kept in case there ever were to be some sort of um, outbreak of smallpox that was, was derived from some natural source and new vaccines needed to be developed. But because the smallpox has been eradicated for so long at this point, people aren't even vaccinated for smallpox anymore. It just doesn't exist. Next, we have chickenpox and shingles. Both of these diseases are caused by the varicella zoster virus. Chickenpox, like Fifth's disease, is one of those diseases that is more mild when acquired during childhood, but can be more serious and severe if acquired during adulthood. Its portal of entry is the respiratory system, but after about two weeks, the infection becomes localized in the skin and forms these reddened lesions all over the surface of the skin. A person who has been infected with chickenpox can also later develop shingles. Shingles is caused by the reemergence of a latent infection of the varicella zoster virus that has remained um, latent in the dorsal spinal cord since the time of the initial chickenpox infection. Activation is usually triggered by lowering of immunity as a natural part of the process of aging. Although people who have um, immunocompromising events take place in their lives can also experience outbreaks of shingles, even if they're not um, among an older group category. The way that shingles usually presents is lesions that appear around the waist and the torso on one or the other side of the body. So it's an asymmetrical presentation. Interestingly, shingles is contagious as chickenpox. So if someone is not immune to chickenpox, either through having previously acquired it or through the vaccination, and they are exposed to someone who has shingles, they can catch and develop chickenpox. One way to avoid ever getting shingles is to make sure that you get the chickenpox vaccine um, because the vaccine will prevent you from getting chickenpox and developing this latent infection. Next we have measles, also sometimes referred to as rubiola. Measles is caused by the measles morbilla virus and like the previous diseases we've discussed, its portal of entry is the respiratory system. Measles is extremely contagious. An infected individual can transmit the disease to up to 90% of those in close proximity to him or her. There are known documented cases of a person who has measles walking into a room and then walking out of that room, and the next person who comes in catches measles from the airborne particulates that were left behind. It is highly dangerous for infants and the elderly who are the two, uh, two groups that are at greatest risk of experiencing severe complications of measles. Systemic infection is characterized by a rash that starts on the face and then spreads to other parts of the body. In the United States, measles has been largely eliminated through the MMR vaccine. Measles, mumps, and rubella is what that vaccination's abbreviation stands for. 
although there have been pockets of uh, vaccine uh, resistance in the United States that have led to a resurgence of measles in some areas in recent years. Next up is rubella, sometimes referred to as German measles. This is caused by the rubella virus, whose portal of entry is also the respiratory system. It's a systemic infection that causes a rash of very small red spots on the body, and it's associated with mild symptoms and a low mortality rate. So why is rubella considered a serious illness if it is so mild? Well, if contracted by a woman during her third trimester of pregnancy, it leads to something called congenital rubella syndrome in 35% of cases. Congenital rubella syndrome is very dangerous. It leads to deafness, cataracts, heart defects, mental retardation, and 15% of babies with congenital rubella syndrome die within their first year of life. The last major rubella outbreak before vaccination became common was in the 1960s, and it resulted in 20,000 babies being born with congenital rubella syndrome in the United States. So this is why vaccination for rubella is a public health priority. This leads us into another checkpoint about these viral illnesses we've just discussed. A 57-year-old woman presents with a rash on the left side of her waist. What virus is likely responsible? We've made it through the viral diseases of the skin, and now we're going to move on to talk about the fungal diseases. The first of these is tinnitus, also known more colloquially as ringworm. Ringworm is caused by dermatophyte fungi, which are defined as fungi that require keratin in order to survive. They can find keratin in abundance on the surface of the skin and in hair follicles, and this is why they localize their infection here. They may infect the skin, the nails, the scalp, and these infections are highly contagious, very transmissible with direct contact between individuals, but they are also self-resolving. They can be transmitted through direct contact with infected organisms that do not necessarily have to be human. Animals are susceptible to ringworm as well. As we can see, this cat right here has a case of ringworm. And the reason why we know this is because ringworm is detectable with black light. It fluoresces under UV light. And so we can see fluorescent patches just below this cat's nose and on its toes. These are very common areas for ringworm to manifest in animals. In humans, it can manifest in the beard, the scalp, in the pubic area, and these same species of fungi can also grow underneath the fingernails and the toenails. Next is candidiasis. Candidiasis is an opportunistic infection caused by the overgrowth of candida albicans, which is a dimorphic species of fungus, meaning that it can grow either as a yeast or as a mold. And these infections can happen in several areas of the body. Most commonly is vaginal candidiasis, or a yeast infection. Oral candidiasis, which is referred to as thrush, and which you can see in this image right here. Systemic candidiasis can also occur, meaning that the candida albicans pathog pathogen permeates throughout the body. However, this is extremely rare and typically only seen in immunocompromised people, particularly people with AIDS. Risk factors for the emergence of candidiasis include broad-spectrum antibiotic treatment. Broad-spectrum antibiotics will kill normal members of your microbiome but it will not affect the fungus that is present in your microbiome because remember, antibiotics are antibacterial drugs. They selectively kill bacteria by targeting their cell wall material, by targeting their ribosomes, etc. They have no effect on fungus. By wiping out all the good bacteria and leaving the fungus behind, this gives Candida albicans the opportunity to proliferate and grow and develop into an infection. 
In addition to broad-spectrum antibiotic use, other risk factors for candidiasis include diabetes and pregnancy, as well as being immunocompromised. Now lastly, we have a single parasitic infection of the skin to talk about, which is lice. Lice is caused by the insect Pediculus humanus and is also referred to as pediculosis in the medical terminology. These tiny insects, as you can see in this electron microscope image, have legs that are specially adapted to grasp human hairs. They colonize the scalp and then they bite the scalp and feed on the blood of their hosts. They are highly transmissible through direct contact and are treated usually with topical insecticide applications or mechanical removal procedures. There are actually uh, individuals or companies out there who specialize in lice removal and can be hired to come out and remove the lice from your hair. So this completes our discussion of skin diseases. And now at the very end of this lecture, we're going to go over some of the uh, more common infections that are seen of the eye. So the anatomy of the eye, um, just to go over a few basics, includes lacrimal glands that secrete tears up at the top here, and lacteral, lacrimal puncta, which collect those tears and then drain them into the nasolacrimal duct, which passes down the throat and into the stomach. Your eye is covered in mucous membranes, and your eyelids are also on the inner side covered in mucous membranes that are together called the conjunctiva. Different parts of the eye can become infected. Conjunctivitis refers to inflammation of the conjunctiva. Blepharitis refers to inflammation of the eyelid. And keratitis refers to inflammation of the cornea. Now, conjunctivitis, blepharitis, and keratitis can be caused by uh, microbes that are either viral or bacterial. The most common cause of a bacterial conjunctivitis infection is Haemophilus influenzae, and the most common viral cause is adenovirus. But here we're going to take a look at some of the more severe and serious forms of eye infections, including, first of all, ophthalmia neonatorum, which is a severe form of conjunctivitis caused by the sexually transmitted bacteria Neisseria, gonor uh, pardon me, Neisseria gonorrhea or Chlamydia trachomatis. These can be transmitted from mother to child during birth and lead to severe eye infections that if left untreated can cause permanent blindness. So this is one reason why it is important for pregnant women who plan to deliver vaginally to ensure that they do not have an undetected sexually transmitted infection with some of these two bacteria. However, if they do have an undetected infection, it is common procedure now to treat infants with a antimicrobial solution upon birth just to make sure that there is no risk of such infections developing in the eyes of the infant. Trachoma is a severe form of conjunctivitis caused by chlamydia trachomatis in adults, and it's transmitted via hand contact or contact with fomites. If trachoma is left untreated and allowed to become chronic, its mechanism by which it damages the eye is pretty gnarly. It causes the eyelashes to turn inward and via repeated scraping of the eyelashes up against the cornea can lead to blindness. Next, we have a protozoan infection. Encanthamoeba keratitis is caused by protozoans in the genus Encanthamoeba, which you can see one example right here. They reside in unchlorinated fresh water samples as well as in the soil and they can lead to corneal ulceration and permanent damage unless they are treated quickly. Improper contact lens use is a risk factor because these protozoan parasites can become trapped underneath the surface of contact lenses between the lens and the cornea where they can foster an infection. 
so it's important to properly clean and change contact lenses if you've been swimming in freshwater sources. Last but not least, we have loiasis, which is caused by the roundworm loa loa, which is a helminth that is also known as the African eye worm. Somewhat of a misnomer because this worm actually causes systemic infections, although those infections are often detected when the worm becomes visible in the eye. It is transmitted during its larval stage by deer flies, which, like mosquitoes and ticks, are blood-sucking insects. They migrate through the skin and conjunctiva and can cause temporary eye pain and itching, but usually no lasting damage to the eye. Rarely, long-term infection with loa loa can cause damage to vital organs, including the kidneys, heart, and liver. So this wraps up our discussion of eye infections. For our final checkpoint, I want you to choose one of the eye infections highlighted in the lecture and describe a method of preventing this infection. Once you've finished this checkpoint, you're finished with chapter 21.